Brother Mike, don't make introductions promising something that I'm not going to live up to. <laughs> Our guitarist said he was upstaged by his wife. Listen, I was upstaged all afternoon. Brother Given, Brother Louis, Sister June, Brother David, they've already said what I'm supposed to say tonight, so I can just stop and go. But is there anybody here who wasn't here this afternoon? All right, for your sakes. <laughs> for your sakes, I'll go on. But before I do, I've got to tell you something. At one of our meetings over in Joplin, after one of the sessions, Brother Aaron Hutchcraft said to me, said, you and your brother say the same thing, only he uses less words. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's the only thing I outdo him in. <laughs> No, I really said that because I'm making a disclaimer right now. <laughs> I want to take the words of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians and let you know, I know, that I've not come to you with excellency of speech or with superior wisdom so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Amen. Amen. And that's all I have. I've got to trust that he's going to take something from me and through me and offer something meaningful to you. And I recognize that so strongly that as this subject has been assigned to me, it's not that I don't have something important to say. I know that but I just don't have the ability to say it in a way to do justice to what really is in what is going to take a whole session of three days and nights to deal with. I'm going to try to limit mine really to the subject because other aspects of the, the glory of the new covenant are certainly going to be covered by other speakers but I'm supposed to talk about how the new covenant is distinct mm -hmm. from the old. Mm -hmm. And please, if you'll bear with me in this, and I know you might want to run to other things, other aspects of the covenant, and as I say, other brothers and sisters will deal with that in due time. But right now, and not Believe me, it's not from form because I don't usually stop. As you know, in the past sessions where we've been together in these different places, I haven't done this, but I do feel the need to right now look to the Lord. Will you join me? Gracious Father, I want to say what you want me to say. I believe that I've done the best that I know how in preparing and writing out this message so that I can say just the words that I think are most appropriate. I want you now to help me to say it in the way that you want it to be said and I want these people here to receive it just the way you want them to receive it. Please, Father, keep this from sounding dry, or dull, or reedy. Please perform a miracle tonight on me as I read this and on these who are present as they listen. Lord, when you announced on that Pentecost that your promised new covenant had been fulfilled, you caused each one there to hear it in his own native language. Just so tonight, Father, cause each one in this place to hear in the truest language of their heart about your wonderful work in and through your Son, Jesus. 
The Jesus whom you made to be Lord in Christ. The Jesus who is our oldest brother. And who is the firstborn from the dead. Provides in himself our perfect access to you. The Jesus who is the basis of our fellowship with you. Now and eternally. I pray this in his name and I thank you Father. Amen. 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 As of course you can read the program and hear the introduction. You know that the title, the theme of this whole is the glory of the new covenant. And the part that has been assigned to me is to tell how that the new covenant is distinct from the old covenant. My text for it is what has already been read several times and those who are here this afternoon are going to hear it again. It's from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. And then the statement that it has been fulfilled in the 8th chapter of Hebrews. Between the promise and the fulfillment lay a gap of seven centuries. So let's listen again to the promise that was made seven centuries earlier. Reading now from Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and I'm using the New International Version, but very little difference from the King James Version. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Amen. Now 700 years later, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 8, verses 7 through 12, is stressing the distinction of the new covenant from the old covenant. And he prefaces it saying, if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. Amen. But God found fault yeah. with the people. Yes. And said, and here the writer quotes that prophecy from Jeremiah, just essentially word for word. And then he adds the observation by calling this covenant new. Mm -hmm. He has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete is aging and will soon disappear. Amen. Now this was to readers that were saturated with the Hebrew mindset conditioned upon a, by a covenant that was based upon law keeping. There had been centuries long practice of Hebrew ritual, ceremonies, now, when the writer of Hebrews declares that the new covenant is better than the old covenant, and therefore distinct from it, he says it is better in many ways. And we could talk about the angels, the priests, the blood, the sacrifices. But those are all for one purpose. To show that the principle upon which the new covenant is based is new and therefore better than Amen. the principle upon which the old covenant was based. Amen. The basis is new because the basis of the old was inadequate. Mm -hmm. It didn't bring about access to God. 
and continued favor in the presence of God. The old could only bring a person before a veiled God from whom they were curtained off. The new covenant is better because it brings us right into the holy of holies and gives us full and perfect access to God and full favor from God and fellowship with God. The old covenant could bring only so far, but no further. The new covenant brings us all the way for this life and for the life to come. The reason that the old covenant was inadequate was because its basis was God's law. The reason the new covenant is adequate is because the basis is God's Son. Amen. That's the distinction Amen. between the new covenant and the old. The need of mankind right here at the close of the 20th century is no different from the need of mankind in the early part of the first century. Our need is access to God. Our need is favor with God. Our need is fellowship with God. That's our need. And that we need an unshakable basis that this is possible. That this is not only possible, but that it is realized. That we are not looking forward to it, but we have it now. That's our need. Our need is this current relationship with God that can survive everything that happens within this life to these bodies of ours. Mm -hmm. And to everything that's mortal. So we need to clarify one thing as we show or try to show the distinction of the new covenant. The old covenant was not faulty because God's commands were bad. Brother David made such an excellent presentation of that. It is not that God's commands are faulty, but people's hearts are faulty. The fault is not with God. The fault is with us. God's law, engraved by his own finger on tablets of stone, were not, are not bad. They are good. They are holy. They are just. But God's people, our hearts, are faulty. And they still are faulty. God's holiness and his command for us to be holy requires a power that's far greater than commandments. It requires God himself in us to enable us to keep his will. Now that point's critical, so I, I want us to really get it. The old covenant, which was made at Sinai, in summary form is this. God said to the people, here is my law. Keep it and you will live. Break it and you will die. The people responded, we will keep your law. That in essence is the old covenant. Everything else about the covenant is secondary. Because it's based upon this fundamental and foundational principle of law keeping. Now that's what I say is, is, is critical that we get that. And if we can keep from thinking about anything else right now, let's just think about the basic principle upon which the Old Covenant was based and the basic principle upon which the New Covenant was based because that's what I am supposed to be talking about. Now, if we're to see the distinction between the Old and the New Covenants, it's essential that we grasp the principle upon which each is based. If this seems repetition, repetitious to us, I know it. Because it's so difficult. It was difficult for me to come to this concept. And I know that it may be difficult for some people besides myself to do this. 
But unless that we can see the basic difference in the foundations of the, new, the two covenants, we will wind up with a very shallow concept of the new covenant. We'll see only relatively minor differences between the two, and that most assuredly will lead us to miss the glory of the new covenant. So, at the sake of becoming boring, let's state again, the old covenant was based upon the principle of law-keeping. The particular law was the Mosaic law, but the principle itself is the keeping of God's command. And you know, any covenant since then which is based upon that principle mm-hmm. is not really a new covenant at all in the, right. in the promised sense Amen. of the promised new covenant, regardless of what that we might call it. Only if the principle upon which the covenant is based is really different can it be said to be a new covenant. Amen. And only if the principle upon which it's based is different and better and adequate can it be properly called the promised new covenant that Jeremiah spoke about. My job tonight is not just to say that the new covenant is different and better, but to try to show that difference in a way that really makes a difference to our minds here and now. Brothers and sisters, Brother Mike knows that I asked to be assigned this subject. I really did. And he graciously allowed me to have my choice. And I'll tell you why. Because in my 55 years of trying to preach, I found that right here, in this subject matter that I'm trying to talk about tonight, right here, in the failure to distinguish the principle upon which each of the covenants is based. Right here, that failure has caused more pain, more suffering, more heartache, more anxiety, more distress for God-fearing brothers and sisters, Bible-believing men and women, people who love the Lord and want to do His will. Right here, has been the basis not only for that but for the partisan strife and debate more than anywhere else. I'm not talking about mean-spirited people. I'm talking about people like you and me that want to know and do the will of God but because that so often we have failed to make that distinction in the principle, the foundational principle of the new covenant as distinct from the old covenant that we have our uncertainties about whether God is pleased with us, whether he accepts us, whether we will be saved. Oh, my. It seems to me that as I got to the point where I was beginning to read the Bible in a way that could see this, that what shackles fell off. What blinders just were stripped away. And praise and thanksgiving Mm -hmm. to God just roll out. Look, I don't have this in this, but let me tell you something. God has given me a blessing that I cannot tell you how great to me that it is. It's just like an endless tape of music, of praise that goes on in my unconscious mind. I wake up from sleep and there's a praise song that's going. Now it varies of course. It goes the whole repertoire. But you know, that's only something that's happened in the last 15 or 20 years. But I just praise the Lord for it. It's such an assurance of His Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God, that the fear that inhibits is gone. 
And that's such a feeling of freedom. And I praise him for it. But this failure to distinguish between the principle on which the new covenant is based from the old covenant, that's not confined to our particular religious fellowship. It is the heritage of religion universally. Amen. Amen. Pagan and otherwise. Let, let me try to use an analogy here to help us get in step in seeing what I'm talking about. All of us know that in business relations there's something called a bottom line. Anybody that hadn't heard that? <laughs> you know, after all the sales talk, after all the promotional gimmicks, after all of the telling about what you've got in store coming to you and so on, what's the bottom line? How much is it going to require? Now that's a, in every religion, there's a bottom line. Amen. There's something that when you boil it all down, what does it cost? So I'm going to ask the question, what's the bottom line in our religion? What's the bottom line in your relationship with God? You know, after you get it all, what does it take to get from God what you want? Access to God are the gods among pagans. Favor from him or them. That's what religion is about. Mm -hmm. That's just the basic nature of religion. Now in every religion there has to be some kind of basis on which a person can expect something from God before there can be anything other than just chaos in the relationship with him. There has to be some kind of mutual understanding, or at least an understanding on the part of the worshiper of what he conceives to be the relationship. Now that basis or bottom line, I say, is essentially the same thing in all religions except one. There's, in Latin, it's called quid pro quo. Literally, something for something. If you will do that, I will do this. That's just basic in human contracts, as well as the covenant with God. Covenant, contract, you know, we're talking about essentially a same th kind of concept there, aren't we? And along with all those agreements is the understanding that if either party fails to live up to his promise, then the covenant is rendered null and void. And the other party is not responsible for fulfilling his promise. That's just the basic understanding in contracts or covenants, mm -hmm. except one. Down through human history, all religions have sought access to and favor with God. Now, of course, the externals of those religions, the seals, the signs, the rituals, they vary. But the principle... I keep coming back to that. Mm -hmm. I will do this if you will do that. I will do that if you will do this. I mean, that kind of bargaining relationship with the exception of the new covenant. Amen. All other contracts are based upon doing mm -hmm. by both parties. We have to see this now if we're going to understand what the, the basis of the Old Covenant is and how the basis of the New Covenant is different. Amen. In other words, the principle of correctly keeping the fine print. 
of keeping the commandments, the ordinances, the principle of correctly keeping the laws, the commandments of one's God. Rightness with one's God on those bases is based squarely upon doing. And that's exactly the principle upon which the Old Covenant is based. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me here. Don't conclude that I'm saying something, Brother David, he labored with this, didn't you? Don't conclude that I'm saying something that I'm not saying, or that I'm even implying something that I'm not implying. I'm not saying in any sense that the commandments of the Old Covenant are on a par with the commandments of the pagans. Not at all. God's commands are from God. Amen. God's commands are holy because He's a holy God. God's commands are faultless because He is faultless. Amen. The fault of the Old Covenant was not on God's part fault was on the heart of the people, which is the inability, the inability of you, of me, of everyone else to live up to the commandments of God. A perfect God has a perfect law, and a perfect law requires perfect people, and I'm not perfect. And if you haven't found out yet, you're not either. We have to see this as a universal fault. Amen. It never corrects itself. Remember, the Old Covenant was based on the principle of do these and live, break them and die. By this covenant, access to God and favor with Him, conditioned upon one's obedience to God's law. If one fully and completely lived up to all of God's law, he would be righteous. Mm -hmm. And you and I know that there's only one righteous one in that sense. And that's the basis of the new covenant. The bottom line in every other covenant puts it squarely upon the basis of doing which is one's own works. And right here, people who have never conceived of a covenant based upon anything other than that of law-keeping find it real difficult to follow. I don't know whether you found it out, but I find that sometimes when I'm trying to talk to people like this, they don't, they can't grasp. What are you talking about? I don't understand you at all. Sounds like you just contradicting everything I've ever believed. You don't believe in God, God's law. You don't believe in keeping God's law. Are you saying that you shouldn't keep God's law? Well, Paul encountered that when he said some people say that that's what we're saying, but their condemnation is just. Mm -hmm. You know, I found that sometimes we can honestly say one thing and mean something else like using the word grace, but really meaning law. <laughs> of, of saying the word free, but really meaning bound. Yeah. Or in the sense of free and meaning having to pay. Have you ever received these things like I do, seems like every week, offer of a free gift through the mail? Some of you have, haven't you? Have you ever tried to follow that up? You find it's anything but free. <laughs> it turns, it carries a very steep purchase price, although it was advertised as free. And so it is with some people's concept of the new covenant. Many people preach a gospel of grace, but when we respond, we find out it's only a Christianized form of the old covenant of works because the foundational principle turns out to be that same old principle of law keeping. This is a carryover from not only our pagan heritage but especially our Jewish heritage that is as we have been 
heirs through the new covenant of the promises and the precepts and so on of the old covenant. So we come by it honestly. But in spite of the, you know, we've been so accustomed to looking at the new covenant in terms of law that we see it just everywhere. And it, it, it's even in the very scriptures that were written to contradict that, like Romans and Galatians, we find law, command, precepts all the way through that we bind on ourselves and especially on one another. This was the mindset of the Pharisees in Jesus' day. He warned them, you know, John 5, 39, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Amen. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. But the legal mindset just goes on functioning the same way. So there are many people who don't think it's strange at all to see in every part of the Bible the law, which Brother David, you know, you said the uh, direct commands, uh, what else was it you said? The necessary inferences, the approved examples, we got those kind of tangled around in order the way that they were originally. And you know what? We from my wing of our restoration movement have even seen in the silences of the scripture a law. <laughs> the unwritten law of silence. We can just see law everywhere we look, if that's... You know, it reminds me about that fellow that went to the psychiatrist. And he was given the Rorschach test, you know, where you have the ten successive ink blots, and you're supposed to tell what each you see in each one of them. And this fellow, in every one of them, he saw some sexually explicit something. At the end, the psychiatrist said, you know... I think it's very significant that you see dirty sex in everything. And the fellow blared back, Well, I'm not the one to blame. You're the one that shows me the dirty pictures. And so it is to the legal mindset. Just can't see anything but law in a covenant of grace. In a new covenant that's not based on law keeping at all. What are you talking about? Well, we follow in a long line of succession from the Judaizers in the early church down to the present. The rise of Catholicism just greatly strengthened the legalistic concept of God as lawgiver and judge. There was the holding to the position that since sin is transgression of the law, that that's in essence what sin is. Sin is, you know, in its entirety, transgression of the law. And so man's greatest need was to escape the penalty of broken law. That sounds reasonable, doesn't it? The essence of Jesus' work was expressed in terms of his satisfaction of the demands of justice for broken law. And so there was the imparting to the church the power to act on God's behalf in absolving people of the penalty for broken law to administer the merits of Christ. So conformity to church dogma became the means of access to God and favor from it. Well, the Reformation movement began out of that kind of background. The chief concern of the reformers was reforming the system. In spite of their reaction to Catholicism, the emphasis shifted only somewhat because of the concept of access to God and favor with him as a system. 
To them, God was still fundamentally lawgiver and judge. Mankind is under judgment because of broken law. Man's chief need is forgiveness. The work of Christ was essentially bearing the penalty that divine justice imposed for broken law. According to this concept, salvation was still, in essence, the repair of the damage that's caused by broken law. Do you react as I do toward all of this? That Really, is this the relationship with God that the Son has? That Jesus himself has with God? We say, well, of course not, because he didn't transgress the law. But relationship with God goes beyond repairing the damage that's caused by broken law. Amen. It goes beyond just dealing with the fact of guilt. In reality, sin is the symptom and not the problem. Amen. The problem is alienation from God. Amen. And until that alienation is bridged, the new covenant has not been seen. Amen. That which keeps us from God, even if it were all destroyed, taken away, would that necessarily mean that we had fellowship with God? Amen. What this legal approach, based upon do this and I will do that, conveys to me far more the cold and threatening atmosphere of a courtroom with a judge and me there as someone under indictment instead of when I used to go home with my brothers and my sister and my mother and my father and we'd gather in the family room. There is no comparison between those atmospheres at all. In Jesus' story of the prodigal, the filthy son is not only cleaned up, but he is led to sit at the table in the Father's house as the guest of honor. Amen. Now that's good news. Amen. That's good news. This my son who was dead now is alive. He was lost, but now is found. The leaders of the Reformation movement had yet to see that the essential work of Jesus involved far more than just dealing with the fact of guilt. Like the elder son, they had not yet come to realize that favor with God can never be based upon obedience to commands. In bridging alienation of sons from each other as well as from their father, we must first of all value intimacy. Mm -hmm. Amen. And then, secondly, we must share intimacy. Amen. Intimacy with God. Intimacy with God's family, my brothers and my sisters. That is the essential work of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. That intimacy with the Father and the Father's family is the most important thing that God wants. That's what the older brother didn't see. And that's why he missed the feast. Unfortunately, the reformers missed that too. I could go on and talk about the ways how they spoke of grace but really meant law. Even faith was regarded in a legalistic sense as work. John Calvin saw that contradiction and he tried to overcome it by developing that doctrine of the sovereignty of God that led to predest doctrine of predestination and perseverance of the saints. But to them, and I'm quoting, the covenant of grace meant compulsory conformity to divine law. Now our restoration movement that's getting down to us. We came out of that background. Mm -hmm. And it was the failure to distinguish between the new and the old covenant that led Alexander Campbell 
to give his celebrated sermon on the law at the Redstone Baptist Association at Cross Creek, West Virginia in 1816. In that sermon, Campbell stressed that we are no longer under Old Testament law, which the reformers just indiscriminately mixed up. But Campbell stated that we are now under the New Testament law. Do you get that? Mm -hmm. You see, reforming the religious system was Campbell's objective. And to that end, he and those who joined him endeavored to, quote, restore the ancient order. His theology expressed most clearly in his most famous book called The Christian System. The leaders of this restoration movement still viewed access to God and relationship with him as a legal matter. In principle, their distinction between the Old and the New Covenants was simply the difference between Old Law and New Law. In essence, only the seal, the symbols, and the rituals were viewed as having been changed, not the principle itself. And so, to this mindset, what had been formally commanded under one covenant might be prohibited under another. And what had been prohibited under the Old Covenant could be commanded under the Old without seeing any contradiction in God himself. Because to their mind, God was regarded in the same way that people regarded the divine rights of king. The king can do no wrong. And God can do anything he wants to because he's God. You know, to view God like this, I want to be respectful in the way that I say it, but it seems to me that this reduces our concept of God to essentially that of that 600-pound gorilla in the joke that can sleep anywhere he wants to. Is that the view of God, that Jesus came to present an arbitrary, capricious God This distorts our concept of God. Amen. Amen. Jesus told a story about a one-talent man, that's what we call him, the man that was given the one-talent. And when his master returned, he was very, very disappointed and displeased. And what had happened was the concept of the master had distorted everything that the servant did. Amen. Because it was based upon that kind of view of rules keeping. What he said was, I knew you are a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathered where you have not gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the, in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. All of this servant's service, everything that he did was conditioned on this distorted view of his master. Amen. You were hard, so I was afraid. And Jesus condemned such a view of God. Amen. Amen. To conceive of God like that makes us, it, it just shackles us we cannot freely and fully use what God is in, has entrusted to us. If our relationship with God depends upon playing it safe with Him, then we are not free to be authentic sons and daughters of the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Most of our pioneer preachers viewed law-keeping as the fundamental principle. And so they spoke of it in these impersonal terms, and I've got a long list of them here that I won't take time to read. I'll just, you know what it is, divine dispensation, divine system, divine order, divine economy, divine, and on and on and on in these impersonal terms. It distorts our concept of Christ. Amen. I've had people to say, 
Now, I don't know why Jesus had to die. You hear songs like that. I don't know why. As though that it's arbitrary. You see, Jesus didn't really have to come to earth. But that's the way God wanted it. And so that's the way it turned out. Because if it's to satisfy a broken law, if it's still on the basis of rules keeping that we have access to God, it's hard to explain it in an ethically consistent way. As I said before, this just does not at all convey to me the concept of God that Jesus in the four gospel messages conveyed. We have a daycare in our home congregation that has over 300 children in it five days a week. I bring the chapel there every fourth week. And of course I talk to the children much more often than that in their classrooms and so on. I can't explain these things to little children. They can't see God like that at all. Mm -hmm. They can see Jesus. And they can see Jesus as a loving, caring, accepting person. Am I going to tell them that God is not like that? Didn't Jesus say something about unless that we become like little children? Mm -hmm that we shall never see the kingdom of God. Well, let me skip over some other things. I want to touch on this. Before the covenant made at Sinai, the only covenants recorded are those with Noah and with Abraham. By the way, it was in the second century that the concept Irenaeus developed the concept that for every relationship between God and man there was a covenant and he said that there were three covenants the patriarchal the mosaic and the Christian you won't find that looking in a concordance but that's what he said but anyway if we look for a patriarchal covenant we won't find it As I said, we find only two covenants recorded. The one with Noah and the one with Abraham. That's before the Mosaic Covenant. God told Noah in Genesis 9, 8, 11, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature on earth. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. That's it. There was no quid pro quo, no something for something. I will do this if you do that. The basis of this covenant was simply God's own faithfulness to his own promise. There was no requirement for Noah to do anything. Now watch. Wait a minute. Don't turn me out yet. The only other covenant recorded is the one he made with Abraham. In Genesis 15 and 18 it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land. That's it. Like God's covenant with Noah, this one rested solely upon God's faithfulness and not on Abraham's requirement to do anything. The record says of Abraham, and Abraham believed the Lord. And he accounted it to him as righteousness. This was a covenant of friendship. Not law keeping. Friendship. And from then on Abraham has been known as the friend of God. In the fourth chapter of Romans, the Apostle Paul contrasts the basis of Abraham's friendship relation with God and that of the law keeper's relation. Romans 4, 1 through 8 What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? 
Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trust God who justifies the wicked, yeah. his faith is credited as righteousness. Amen. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Then from Romans 4, Paul begins writing in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Amen. And then Paul goes on to state in verse 13 what we mentioned. It. Well, I skipped over that a while ago in, in time. Sin is not, in verse 13 of chapter 4, sin is not taken into account where there is no law. In that context, he says, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who didn't sin according to a commandment. But he said, sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Amen. Not being law, sin is not accounted. Mm -hmm. That's Amen. significant. Amen. If we realize that Christ, as the basis of the new covenant, has freed us from that basis of law keeping, you see, sin is not charged against us. Mm -hmm. I can sing like David, blessed is Harold Key to whom the Lord will not reckon my sin. Amen. That's the glory Amen. of the new covenant for me. <laughs> and you put your name in there and that's the glory of the new covenant for you. Amen. From chapter 5, Paul goes on in chapter 6. 14 says, Sin shall not be your master because you're not under law but under grace. Amen. In chapter 7, he talks about this conflict within him, this higher and lower nature. And he uses an analogy to the barbarian manner of taking prisoners. When they took prisoners, they bound them face to face, body to body, arm to arm, leg to leg with a corpse. And left them until the rottenness of the one kill the other. That's what Paul means when he says there, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Amen. That is the torment that's inherent in law keeping. Because of the carnal, the lower human nature to which each one of us is bound. When Paul met Jesus, when he met Jesus, not just heard about him, but when he met the living Lord, he shouted, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from this law of sin and death. Amen. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then in the whole of chapter 8 of Romans, Paul writes of the blessedness of the one who has been freed from the bondage of the old covenant. Based upon the principle of the law keeper, Peter put it this way in the 15th chapter of Acts, a yoke which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. Amen. Could I do one thing here just to try to use a demonstration to show in a way, Jesus used those kind of things, so I think I'm in good company. Let me see if I can find it. I have just a common old nail. Can everyone see it? Over here I have a magnet. And you know what a magnet is. This is the same kind of material as this except for one thing. This has been so undergone such tremendous pressure that every molecule is it, it, in it is perfectly aligned up with every other one. 
I've seen this under electron microscope. Not this particular one, but I've seen magnets under an electron mic microscope where the polarity is reversed in every, just like a row of dominoes, they do a flip-flop, every one of them, just right together. Well, I want to show you, because of that nature of this, it has a power to attract that. Now, we all know that. But let me show you. While it attracts, if the weight is on the nail, when stress comes, when stress comes, it falls away. In itself, it is not sufficient to hold on to the magnet. But if I reverse it and let the magnet hold the nail, all the stress, you see, it's still there. It's from this to this. If our relationship with God is based upon how we hold on to Him, how we keep His commands, it'll let us down. That's why there had to be a new covenant. Amen. Amen. There had to be a new covenant. If we're going to have and keep fellowship with God in favor with Him. Let me close by reading from the third chapter of Romans and the Living Bible. Just listen, if you could, listen to it. Now do you see it? No one can ever be made right in God's sight by doing what the law commands. Mm -hmm. You see? For the more we know of God's law, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying them. His laws serve only to make us see that we are sinners. But now God has shown us a different way to heaven. Not by being good enough and trying to keep His laws. But by a new way, though not really new. For the scriptures told about it long ago. Now God says He will accept us and acquit us, declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. Mm -hmm. And we can all be saved in this same way. By coming to Christ, no matter who we are or what we've been like. Yes, all have sinned. All fall short of God's glorious ideal then what can we boast about doing to earn our salvation? Nothing at all. Why? Why? Because our acquittal is not based on our good deeds. It is based on what Christ has done and our trust in Him. Well then, if we are saved by faith, does this mean that we no longer need obey God's law? Just the opposite. Just the opposite. In fact, only when we trust Jesus can we truly obey Him. Amen.